Hello and welcome to Salty About Health. My name is Delaney Algier and I'm here with my mom and co-host, Mary. So mom, why are we salty about health? Good question. It's because both of us have had struggles, some more serious than others, and no one showed us simple ways we could jump into the driver's seat and take control. And why are we sharing our views with our listeners? Well, because we want our listeners to realize that it may take time, but with some simple knowledge about health, they'll be able to make a few changes and dig deeper to take control of their well-being and live a more vibrant life. That's fantastic. But right now, before we get into all of that, we just need to do some housekeeping. Here we go. This is an opinion-based podcast. This is not in any way offered as a diagnosis or treatment for any disease, illness, or infirmity for physical or mental condition or any other condition you may have. We are not doctors or practitioners of any kind. Persons needing medical care should obtain it from a medical practitioner. So consult your practitioner before making any health decision. The opinions offered here in this podcast are ours alone. Again, we're not doctors, and the banter you're going to be listening to is our view and our view alone. Okay, that's done. We, of course, also want to have an open dialogue with our listeners. So stay tuned to the end of the episode, and we'll let you know all of the ways that we can connect. Welcome, everyone, to episode eight. We are going to be talking to you about nightshades. Now, most of us don't know what a nightshade is, but most of us actually eat them all the time. In fact, the American diet has a nightshade as the first and third most popular vegetable eaten. Number one is the potato, and number three is the tomato, which I honestly thought was a fruit. But today we are going to talk about some of the health ramifications of nightshades and why they may not be the best thing to eat for some people, especially if you have arthritis, IBS, or an autoimmune disease. So mom, what is a nightshade and why are they classified as such? Well, first of all, you're right. I'm pretty sure a tomato is a fruit, oh, okay. but sometimes we just look at them because we eat them as vegetables. You know, we consider them vegetables, but yes, it is a fruit. I'm not so sure about cucumbers. Are you? Do you know if that's a fruit or a vegetable classified? I always thought they were vegetables, but this is, you know. Oh, look it up while I talk. Okay. okay. <laughs> so nightshades are a botanical family of plants, more technically called Solansia, most of which we would consider weeds. The nightshade family consists of some 2,700 species. They contain a variety of naturally occurring drugs known as alkaloids, which protect the plant from insects, predators, and disease. Popular nightshades that you may be eating include tomato, which Delaney is what? A fruit. A fruit. <laughs> yes. um, she looked it up. It's a I fruit. Did. And um, cucumbers are also a fruit. Which this is like making me really depressed about the salads that I've made in the past because they're just fruit salad apparently. Because not only are tomatoes and cucumbers a fruit, but also beans, peppers, pumpkin, okra can also be considered fruit because they come from a flower and contain their seeds. Apparently that's the defining factor. Very interesting. So we said tomato, but but other nightshades are a potato, eggplant, and all pepper varieties. That is hot peppers and bell peppers, but not black pepper or white pepper. You know, the peppercorns, mm -hmm. that's not a nightshade. Others include okra, goji berries, tomatillos, sorrel, gooseberries, ground cherries, not like you're grinding them, but you know, the ones, the ground oh, okay. cherries, tobacco, paprika, cayenne pepper, and pepino melons. What is a pepino melon? 
I looked that up. It's cute. It's, it looks like a melon. Oh, um, a baby melon? oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I think some of these are used in other cultures more than ours, you know, mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, they are popular. Um, and paprika just makes me think of this is gonna, I guess, age me now. It used to make me seem like a young kid, but Blue's Clues, which I don't think is on anymore, but um, they had salt and pepper. Their little baby was paprika. Oh, <laughs> how so cute. That's what I always remembered. I don't know how much we ate it when I was growing up as a spice, but like I just remember it being on the TV show. So, anyways. Yeah, a lot of people sprinkle paprika on their deviled eggs to make it that, oh, okay. that give it that pretty red. red yeah 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 okay very cool well all of these are common vegetables and as we found out fruit but i would say i definitely have eaten these probably daily so i love bell peppers and banana peppers any peppers <laughs> so i love hot peppers yeah. i did take nightshades out of my diet but when it comes to if i'm eating Mexican food or, or Thai or where, you know, any kind of spicy food. I just love spice, mm -hmm. hot, spicy food. Yeah. So that is true, but it hasn't always been that way. Seems that the Spanish traders introduced us to a lot of them. In fact, the sole exception of eggplant, the traditional diet of China did not include nightshades. And that Taoist dietary guidelines have always strongly discouraged the consumption of nightshades, including eggplant. Before the introduction of nightshades, the Chinese used nightshades only for medicine and not for food. And even in the West, tomatoes and potatoes were once regarded as poisonous. What? Today, nightshades appear everywhere in Western diets, particularly in fast food in the form of french fries and potato chips and i do have a story of the tomatoes be, you know being thought of as poisonous remember when we lived in new england and we went to the place where they always stayed in character something plantation oh plymouth plantation plymouth i think so yeah i think and that was it i and don't remember this because i was one so mom likes to say oh i showed you all around new england when we lived there i was one i don't remember it i had to redo it when i lived up there anyways continue <laughs> well we did we went everywhere with her she was in a uh, backpack uh, on my back and I show you the photos. So there you go. Oh, yeah, that's like the same thing. <laughs> but anyway, we were, you know, in Plymouth Plantation and asked about tomatoes. And the lady, she was so funny. She says, oh, no, they're poisonous. Why would you eat a tomato? And she stayed in character the whole time. And that's the first time I thought, well, why do people think tomatoes are poisonous? Because, you know, I mean, in every garden, you mm -hmm. see tomatoes. And freshly sliced tomatoes with basil and feta cheese with yes. oil and vinegar. No, with mm. um, mozzarella. Oh, mozzarella. There you go. But they did. They did think that potatoes and tomatoes were poisonous back wow. then. So that's interesting because how it's weird how they went from potatoes are poisonous to the people in Ireland are fleeing to America because of the potato famine and they have like no general source of food, you know, because that's, so that, that was like their rice, right? Like if you lived in Asia, like rice is like the basic thing everyone has in Ireland, then potato was the go-to food. So it's interesting that something that was considered poisonous becomes the soul food for, well not soul yeah food, they're you know. staple to get them yeah. through the famine yeah definitely and, and we are going to talk about that okay so we're going to talk about why we have why some people have a problem with some of our most popular foods okay okay so a few reasons but one of the biggest reasons is that nightshade vegetables fall into a class of vegetables that contain solanine and solanine is a calcium inhibitor, a, a calcium inhibitor is a glycoalkaloid poison. So it can occur naturally in any part of the plant, including the leaves, the fruit, and tubers. Solanine has pesticidal properties 
and is one of the plant's natural defenses. So solanine was first isolated in 1820 from the berries of the European black nightshade, after which it was named. Oh. Alkaloids have a powerful physiological effect when consumed and metabolized. So some of those would be caffeine, morphine, cocaine, nicotine, and belladonna. They're all alkaloids with well-known psychoactive effects and toxic properties. Wow. Yeah. So research has implicated nightshades in the calcification of soft body tissues, a condition known as, let's see if we can say this. Give it a try, Delaney. <laughs> Calciphylactic? Yeah, there you go. Calciphylactic syndrome, which has become one of the most prevalent pathological conditions in all modern industrial societies. That's pretty interesting, huh? Yeah. And this is different than, what is it? Because like, don't they say women just don't absorb enough calcium anyways? And that's, you get the, what's it called? Osteoporosis? Is that the one where you that, I have no little... idea. I mean, there are underlying conditions that cause osteoporosis. Okay. And we will get into those. And I think in the next episode, I know we will be talking about that okay. and what healthy foods or too much of one food can do because yeah. coffee can cause problems because it okay. leaches minerals out. Even though it's healthy for a lot of people, it has you know minerals in it but it can also leach out minerals. Wow. I don't want to demonize one food and that's in the next episode. Okay. So the syndrome, which occurs when nightshades remove calcium from teeth and bones and deposit it in tissues where it does not belong, is associated with arthritis, arterial sclerosis, kidney stones, gout, migraine, high blood pressure, osteoporosis, lupus, hypertension, dot, dot, dot. So many people have reported rapid recovery from these ailments, uh, ailments when um, they completely eliminate nightshades from their diets. That includes smoking as tobacco is a nightshade. Okay, so you covered osteoporosis there. And yeah. that's also interesting because again, like, I don't, ever, I don't know if, if anyone reads Jane Austen and all that, but they always, the old people and all the stories always have gout. But again, the UK was very potato based. So that's interesting. There's, yeah, I looked that up and there are other reasons we can do an episode on gout. It's very interesting. And uh, I have a book, something about curing dental disease or something like that. And one of his suggestions is to stop nightshades mm -hmm. because if your teeth especially up at the tops, are losing calcium and demineralizing, one of the best things you can do is stop eating nightshades, he says. And I'm sure we quote that somewhere in the next episode or so. Okay. So substance intoxication from solanine is characterized by gastrointestinal disorders like diarrhea, vomiting, abdominal pain, and neurological disorders, hallucinations, and headaches. The median lethal dose is between two and five milligrams per kilogram of body weight. So symptoms become manifest eight to 12 hours after ingestion. Mm -hmm. The amount of these glycoalkaloids in potatoes, for example, varies significantly depending on environmental conditions during their cultivation, the length of storage, and the variety. The average glycoalkaloid concentration is 0 0.075 milligrams per gram of potato. And that's why when you're, at least when I was growing up, my mom always told me never eat green potatoes and you'll find out later why huh. and never raw potatoes. Um, okay. They're not to be eaten that way. Um, and to take the eyes out, you know, the little roots are, yeah. that come out. So okay. that's, and we'll discover why later. Yeah, I was going to say, is there other ways that we can prepare the nightshade so they're safer to eat? Yes. And we would peel and de-seed your tomatoes. Like the Italians do that to this day. And you know, I do muscle testing and I can always muscle test for a tomato sauce from 
Italy. It's oh, their, their tomatoes. I forget what brand it is, but they are peeled and deseeded. And again, do not eat green potatoes and notch out any eyes on the potato. Various storage conditions can have an impact on the level of solanine in potatoes. So the glyco alkaloid levels increase when potatoes are exposed to light because light increases synthesis of glyco alkaloids like solanine. So potatoes, and we're gonna, at the end, we're gonna talk about some really weird, well, unfortunate illnesses people got from eating potatoes that were stored you know, um, improperly. And one was a school for children that stored them where they got light. And so you, you should put them in the cellar, you know, in, in, in the dark. Okay. Potatoes um, should therefore be stored in a dark place to avoid increased solanine synthesis. Potatoes that have turned green due to increased chlorophyll and photosynthesis are indicative of increased light exposure and are therefore associated with high levels of solanine. And you can see that sometimes in the grocery mm -hmm. store when you pick your potatoes. Yeah. Or like, again, when you go out to eat and get French fries or whatever, you can, parts of them will be green. And I always thought it was like with other vegetables that it was just like a young part of it, I guess, you know, like, and I thought like they all started green and as they grew, they got rid of that color, but apparently that is not the case. <laughs> no, and, and we need to throw those out and you need to chastise those people who give you green French yeah. fries <laughs> and tell them what's happening. <laughs> Most home processing methods like boiling, cooking, and frying potatoes have been shown to have minimal effects on solanine level. Um, the majority, um, 30 to 80% of the solanine in Potatoes is found in the outer layer of the potato. So therefore, peeling potatoes before cooking them reduces the glyco glycoalkaloid intake from potato consumption. And I read somewhere that red potatoes have the least amount of solanine. Oh, okay, which those are my favorite. So that's interesting. Yeah. But I, unfortunately, I think they want you to peel them. And I don't think you peel your red potatoes. No. Because everybody likes the skin, especially mm -hmm. in mashed potatoes. You yeah, get those red skins. So it looks good. nice. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'll stop doing that. Okay. <laughs> so roast skin and deseed your hot peppers and peppers. And you know where they do that, right? Delaney, we lived in Colorado. You were three or four. So maybe you remember <laughs> that one. They would have pepper festivals. Even where I live now, the Wegmans does it once a year and they have these huge hot uh, pepper, they have these huge bins. Like if you're playing um, bingo and you know how you turn. Oh yes, the, yeah, with all the bingo balls in there. Yeah. Yes, but it's on a huge scale and they put the peppers in there and they roast them and de-skin them. So they're de-skinned. They give them to you in a paper bag and um, so I, they're roasted, so then you can easily de-skin and de-seed them. Um, I forget how that goes because I haven't gotten them in years. Make them less hot because everyone talks about how the seeds of a pepper are the hottest part, but apparently it's the most poisonous too. Yeah, I don't know. I've always thought too. They, well, take the seeds out. Um, so that I don't know. We'll have to look that up. Hmm. But yes, you should not eat the seeds and you should not eat the skin, which is cool because then, you know, it's a lot, well, I shouldn't say safer to eat because some people may not have problems with it, but then the solanine is dropped dramatically. So for a lot of people, that is helpful. And again, you find these this is common in Central South America where they do that to their peppers and hot peppers in a society where they use a lot of them. And in Italy, again, they still de-seed and um, take the skin off yeah. their tomatoes, which is easy to do. You just drop it in a um, hot boiling water real quick and blanch it. Then the, the um, skins come right off of, uh, of a lot of things. You can do hot, just bell peppers also. Unfortunately, they fall into that category too. Well, yeah, that's true. And those are, it's tough because that's like my favorite thing when you're at a picnic and they have the spread of all the cut veggies. Mm -hmm. I, I really like fresh peppers, but apparently I need to cook them first. 
Well, to de-skin them and de-seed them to make it where there's not the solanine content. And if you're having a problem with a lot of things, maybe taking nightshades out Mm -hmm. is an option to see and then slowly add them back in and see if you still have those problems, but do it and also do it properly, de-skin and de-seed them or buy them that way. Okay. Um, Eggplant, I don't know. I mean, when I used to cook eggplant, I always skinned mine and most of it is seed, but um, I would take that out and then a lot of people put the salt on it and let it sit for a little bit on the counter for the bitterness, et cetera. So there's different. Yeah, eggplant, it's hard because I don't think, does anyone eat that raw? It's kind of no, gross. No, I, I never yeah. have. So, But I love eggplant. You know, okay. I mean, you have eggplant parmesan and <laughs> all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I've always liked eggplant. Which is mixing eggplant and tomato, but... <laughs> Oh, I know. But see, if you do it properly. Yeah, then it's fine. Yeah. So, I, well, if you look back at a lot of cultures, they did a lot of things to food that we just decided was too much work. Mm -hmm. And there were reasons for fermenting the food and, you know, preparing it the way that they did. And if you look at it from that aspect, then you realize that it's important right and food should be food should be enjoyable it should be and i know you do this because i was just down visiting you you enjoy making the food kitchen time in most cultures is something that you know people gather around they enjoy the making of the food they sit down and they eat it slowly and enjoy it and like the company and that's something a lot of cultures do every day. Right. It's great for your digestive system. Yes, yes, it is. So should we talk about recorded human poisoning? I'm scared and interested at the same time. Yes, please. <laughs> okay, though fatalities from solanine poisoning are rare, there have been several notable cases of human solanine poisonings between 1865 and 1983. Whoa. There were around 2,000 human cases of solanine poisonings, with most recovering fully and 30 deaths. Wow. Because the symptoms are similar to those of food poisoning, it is possible that there are many undiagnosed cases of solanine toxicity. Okay. And so in that time period, in 1899, there are 56 German soldiers who fell ill due to solanine poisoning after consuming cooked potatoes that contained 0.24 milligrams of solanine per gram of potato, which is a lot because what did you say it normally contains? 0.075 0.075 yeah so the average concentration is 0.075 milligrams per gram of potato just to put it in perspective so thankfully there were no fatalities but a few soldiers were left partially paralyzed and jaundiced well and in 1918 there were 41 cases of solanine poisoning in people who had eaten a bad crop of potatoes that had 0.43 milligrams of solanine per gram of potato, but no recorded fatalities. So that's good. Yeah. So it's interesting because I guess if you grow potatoes, you really need to know what you're doing. You know what I mean? They need to be probably deep underground. If you start pulling them up, you need to put them somewhere where it's dark soon. Mm -hmm. You can't just let them lay out there in the field. And probably the soil, things like that are probably reasons for different solanine levels in potatoes. That's wild. Yeah. So in Scotland in 1918, there were 61 cases of solanine poisoning after consumption of potatoes containing 0.41 milligrams of solanine per gram of potato, resulting in the death of a five-year-old. Oh, that's sad. That is. I wonder, did we find out what year they realized that this could be deadly? 
eating green potatoes and things like that. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. I do know when they said they discovered the nightshade, but you don't see a warning on potatoes. You know, there, there should be a sign, don't eat green potatoes, ah, don't you yeah, think? Really. Or if you grow them in your garden, then make sure they're not green. Take them in and put them in your cellar. This is fun. I just, so <laughs> Google is my friend. Um, I just Googled, like, when did we find out that eating green potatoes is bad for you? And the Food Safety Authority of Ireland, this caught my eye because we're talking about them. And so they have a whole section on green potatoes. And it's like, why do potatoes go green? And again, it's because they're not stored properly and exposed to sunlight. This is everything mom's been talking about. It's pretty cool. And then is there a risk from eating them? Again, it's the glycoalkaloids or a group of toxins. I like that they used whilst, whilst not acutely toxic in humans. <laughs> that's great. Um, but well, they it was for the 30 people that died. Yeah, well, that's what they said. There are a number of reports suggesting that ingestion of potatoes containing high levels of glycoalkaloids have led to poisoning incidents. Oh, yikes. These symptoms have also been shown at high doses of glycoalkaloids in controlled experiments using human volunteers. Oh. Ooh. Ooh, this is interesting too. Available evidence suggests that there is not, oh, okay, not a link between exposure to elevated levels of glycoalkaloids from green potatoes and incidence of spina bifida or other malformations of the fetus. So that's good. <laughs> There's not that's good, a link. but you need your B vitamins to prevent the spina bifida. Okay. <laughs> so, and then they, it finishes with can I eat green potatoes if I peel them? And it says, yeah, peeling again reduces the levels however if they taste bitter after peeling it's best not to eat them and this was last reviewed in 2015. I did read something in the research about the bitterness they said you know you can do that when they're raw or right after you cook if they are still bitter you should not eat a potato. Okay. So I have to ask you well what do you think about green tomatoes right wasn't that a Fried oh, green tomatoes. Fried green Wasn't tomatoes, that a movie? That movie? <laughs> oh my gosh, that movie was wild. We're not going to give away the ending, but whoa. But I wonder if that's dangerous too, that it would yeah, be best to it, have. Are, they're not a different plant, right? It's just unripe tomatoes. Tomatoes. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So that's interesting. I know like tomatillos are like different. Yeah. They're... Yeah, that's weird. Unless maybe if you still de seed and skin them, then it's fine. That's what, after you read the next case report, then you'll have to look that up. Do green tomatoes have more solanine in them? Okay, okay. But so this case report, so this is from 1925, and it reported that seven family members who ate green potatoes fell ill from solanine. I can't say it. Solanine. Okay. From solanine poisoning two days later, resulting in the death of the 45-year-old mother and the 16-year-old daughter. The other family members recovered fully. In another case reported from 1959, four members of a British family exhibited symptoms of solanine poisoning after eating jacket potatoes, question mark, question mark, containing 0.5 milligrams of selenium per gram of potato. What is a That's jacket? That's a lot, right? Potato? That is a lot. Five. That's the most we've seen so far in these. And it was sad that two people that family died. Yes. Yeah, and it was the women, so that makes me very sad. <laughs> so it's like me and you. <laughs> <laughs> that would be sad. <laughs> <laughs> but what... I think I looked up jacket potatoes yeah. when I researched this, but I can't remember. <laughs> Um, what's, you know, what's really interesting too, is the first time that you stopped eating chicken nuggets <laughs> and started exploring with food because you were such a picky eater was when we were at a restaurant and I had ordered, uh, potato skins, right? <laughs> and you finally, cause they had all that cheese and yep. tomato and, and onion and yum on it. And you, then you proceeded to almost eat them all and decided there were better things besides chicken nuggets. <laughs> <laughs> but 
And now I'm thinking, wow, it's amazing we didn't die <laughs> because know, we were just like, eating the skins of the my potatoes. My life is like, I love tomatoes. I love bell peppers. I love potatoes. How am I still alive? What are jacket potatoes called in America? Oh, it's not a type of potato. It's literally pota- eating potato skins. The, it's just the potato skins. a baked potato. Oh cool. oh, cool. So in the UK... It is called jacket potatoes because they still have their skin on. That's adorable. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to make fun of us. They're like, well, you call it a baked potato. That's dumb. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, that is interesting. Kind of like cute aluminum and aluminium. Aluminium, yes. And trapezium instead of trapezoid. There you go. I went to high school with a guy from England, so... This is how we know these things. <laughs> <laughs> Except apparently you didn't go out and get potato skins with them. No, no. Or, we did. He or never baked brought potatoes. Up jacket potatoes. It's so great. <laughs> okay. So um, another poisoning, there was a mass solanine poisoning incident in 1979 in the UK with when... 78 adolescent boys at a boarding school exhibited symptoms after eating potatoes that had been stored improperly over the summer. That's what I was talking about. a long time, yeah. And yeah, and so 17 of them ended up hospitalized, but they all recovered and the potatoes were determined to have between 0.25 and 0.3 milligrams of solanine per gram of potato. Mm. And then this last one, Another mass poisoning was reported in Canada in 1984. This is like pretty recent stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, So there, 61 school children and teachers showed symptoms of selenium. Solanine. Solanine. I want to call it solanine. Solanine toxicity after consuming baked potatoes or jacket potatoes with 0.5 0.5 milligrams of solanine per gram of potato, which again is so that was it again the highest we've seen yeah. 2.5s. Yeah, that's where and like not to be, but just as we're reading these, the few incidents that you have found and presented to us, it's none of it happened in Asia, and it's mostly the UK, with then one in Germany who also. Germany is also like a potato-based culture. So it's just interesting. Yes, yes. But we eat a lot of French fries here in America. Oh, yes. In America. No, I'm sure like, yeah, I'm sure it could happen anywhere. But it's just interesting that the cases are being found in traditionally potato-based cultures. But also like the schoolboys, it was stored, you know, the potatoes were stored for a whole summer. I don't know if anyone... I don't know. It me when I have my potatoes, when I buy them and bring them home, if I don't like eat them in a week, I know they're a root and I know they're supposed to last a long time, but I get weird about them, so I try to eat them quickly. <laughs> I don't know, that might be helping me. Well, definitely peel them now. Yes. And, well, yes, um, yes, yes. But don't I like, eat I green don't, ones. The you, again, the US is just so use everything quickly now now now. Maybe that's kind of helped us with our junk food, you know, cuz we make it so quickly like it doesn't sit around all summer waiting to be i don't know i found a sweet potato that had been around for a while and was perfectly good because it was in a dark (laughs) place that i cooked up the other day um totally fine of course i peel them but and when i had a garden and we had tomatoes i would pick all the green tomatoes before the for first frost and I would just put them in the garage where it was very dark and on a table and they would slowly ripen and I would have red tomatoes at Thanksgiving from the garden. And that's oh, wow. just sitting out there with not doing anything else to them. Yeah. And they were perfectly fine. That's cool. So again, I think if we look back or read the books that people now write about how people stored vegetables because they did have to get 
as far as they could with, you know, fresh vegetables back in the day. And they also canned a lot, but fermenting, things like that, they did those for a reason. They, mm-hmm. they, they took care of their vegetables and their food in certain ways for a reason. And we're finding that it's just basically healthier. Yeah. And so those are very interesting books to read. So here's a, a complete list of nightshades that you might be eating though some of them may be rare in the United States. I should say a more complete. It is not totally complete. But this is just some things that you may be eating and not aware that they are a nightshade because I took nightshades out of my diet. So with all these supplements now that people can buy, everybody puts ashwagandha in them. And I will not take those supplements because that is a nightshade. And that's an herb, but it's a nightshade. Bush tomatoes, which are native to Australia. Cape gooseberries or ground cherries, um, which are different from regular cherries. You can look those up. There's another one, any, any kind of pepper, hot or bell pepper. So you have the cayenne pepper, the chili pepper flakes, the chili powder, Chinese five spice powder, I, which through me, I didn't know curry powder. That is a nightshade. Yeah, that's too bad. I like curry powder. Does it matter which oh, kind? Because there's like red curry, yellow curry. Yeah, you know, you're right. Um, I looked and, and the examples were red. So I don't know if that's... Okay, so maybe yellow. The yellow and the I green. I really like yellow curry. <laughs> okay. But if it's curry, I haven't really looked into curry. I would assume it's all a nightshade, but maybe not. Maybe the solanine is just in the red. Okay. So I don't know. We have to, maybe you can do that while I continue on. Okay. Okay. <laughs> there are, oh, eggplants, which if Delaney said, the, it's pronounced differently in other cultures, especially England. What is that? What? what? You see eggplant and then slash, how do they say that? Oh. Aber, Abergine or something like that. Abergine? That's I have eggplant. no idea what that is. Yeah. Mm. So that's an eggplant, but just that's how they say it in other cultures. Oh, cool. Graham, marsala, spice, because it contains peppers. I know your grandfather made a great dish with that. Garden huckleberries. Another popular one is goji berries, which everybody's eating. That is a nightshade. That's a superfood, and that's a nightshade. Hot sauce, obviously, ketchup, obviously. Um, And most spice ones contain peppers, so you have to be careful. And I saw this word, and you took Spanish. Uh oh. (laughs) Naranjila. What is that? Naranjila. Naranjila. Yeah. Naranjilas. Wow, you got the J and the double L like right there. That's, yeah. Because when our neighbors were telling me I should take Spanish, that it's easy because they spoke Spanish. <laughs> the first word I was introduced to was something called naranja or something for arms. Oh, yeah, and I went, or something. Yeah, I went, oh no, never again because <laughs> that, that was like too difficult for me. But it is known as a little orange in Spanish and it does look like a little orange tomato. Oh, that's cute. Yeah. Yeah, they are. We've I've seen them almost like um, I want to say a persimmon too, but oh, cool. more tomato, you know, looking mm-hmm. <laughs> with the color, <laughs> maybe a persimmon. Yeah, they were pretty. Paprika spice, peppers. Again, all peppers except your black and white pepper, which you sprinkle on food. That is not a nightshade. Mm-hmm. Pimentos, potatoes, which does not include sweet potatoes or yams. Oh, sweet potatoes and yams are not a nightshade. Huh. Red pepper, steak seasoning, tomatillos, tomatoes. Okay. So okay. Delaney, what did you find most interesting about this episode? Well, first, now I know what is in yellow curry, according to Wikipedia. And Good. it has cumin, coriander, turmeric, fenu, fenugreek, garlic, fenugreek. salt, bay leaf, lemongrass, and then you get your cayenne pepper, but ginger, Mm -hmm. and then mace, which makes me think of what you spray it 
people. <laughs> <laughs> and cinnamon. So it does have cayenne pepper in it. Okay. So, yeah. But maybe if you make your own and just get that one out, but then you want the spice. It's tough. <sighs> Okay. <laughs> it's very tough. I'm shaking my head yes because I love hot spicy food. Yeah. And that's the only time, you know, at this point I eat nightshades because it's really hard to give up the spice. Yeah. Cuz it's just so tasty. Most interesting I think was just learning about how many vegetables that I thought were vegetables are actually fruit. Uh, <laughs> it's a big one but no it's interesting that how you you need to pay attention to how you store your food and I don't know if we could ever do an episode on that because I feel like I'm storing my food wrong and it's, like, it's not good yeah, that's a good idea. Um, we could do it on sprouting, fermenting, and the reasons why and why you store certain things in dark yeah. places uh, because I don't think people realize that. And I right. think one of the big things here for me was don't eat green potatoes. People need it. They, I've seen them at the store. And if you see them at the store, just look for other ones. Yeah. I, I wouldn't even try to peel them. Just kind of stay away from them because you know that they're not not being stored correctly in the first place you know yeah that's my thought okay well cool oh, this is really interesting well thanks everyone for listening and again we want to hear from you guys we always want to hear from you guys please 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 reach out to us and uh here are just a few ways that you can do that you can reach out via instagram and facebook find us at salty about health even Snapchat at Salty Health. You can email us at saltyabouthealth at gmail.com. Or if you just want to find all that in one place, check out our website, saltyabouthealth.com. We've got all the ways for you to listen and connect there. And finally, if you like what you hear today, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. We really appreciate it. So, Mom, if they want to hear from you on social media, where can they find you? Okay. I am a certified health coach, and I do coach one-on-one. -on -one. So if you're interested, you can contact me at mary at feedyourselfhealthy.com. I also do research for people who are interested in finding alternative approaches to do in conjunction with the health issue or illness their doctor is treating them for. So again, just reach out to me at mary at feedyourselfhealthy.com or follow me on Twitter at feedyourselfhealthy, which is spelled F-E-E-D-U-R-S-E-L-F-H-L-T-H-Y. That's where they can find me. Cool. Okay. And if you guys want to find me, I'm not a health coach, but I'm on Instagram hanging out there at Delaney.A. Find out how to spell my name in the show notes and everything. And of course, I'll be the one mainly keeping an eye on the social media. So always happy to chat with you guys via the Salty Network. Also, just want to shout out our intro and outro music. It is by Yule. And you can find her at www.yulearts.com. That's E-U-L-A-R-T-S. You can also find her on Instagram at Yule underscore arts or Spotify and YouTube. Check her out. Her piano music and everything else is amazing. And until next time, stay, stay salty. Stay salty.